Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for this half hour Memorial Day edition of Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. This is a day to honor those who have died serving our country and remember their ultimate sacrifice. During the years of the Civil War, more than 11% of white Vermont men answered to the call to serve the Union Army. It was the second highest percentage of any state. But nearly 20% of black men in Vermont also joined, which was the highest percentage in the country. When the war started, blacks could not fight. They could only enlist as servants to white officers. Vermont historian Howard Coffin tells us how that changed, starting in his hometown of Woodstock. On a spring day in 1861, the Woodstock Light Infantry Company stood at attention here in front of the Windsor County Courthouse. But if you look closely, all the faces are white. Despite the fact that 60 black people lived in Woodstock in 1861, when the Civil War began, blacks could not serve. But that would change. 11 Woodstock men would serve, black men, many of them in the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, the most famous of all black regiments. Charles Wentworth had a barber shop in a cellar room here along Woodstock Central Street. He opened it after he came home from the Civil War. Wentworth was born in slavery in Louisiana. He was freed by the 7th Vermont Regiment and he came home with the 7th. And then he enlisted to fight for freedom in the 54th Massachusetts. After the war, he came to Woodstock to become a barber and a member of the local GAR post. Down South Street from the Village Square is Valefield. On Sundays in the 50s, my father and I used to come here to watch the town team play baseball, and they were good. We had a lot of fun, but I always kept getting distracted by the noise coming from a house across the street, the Lewis family house. The blacks from all around this area on their day off gathered there for a party. And sometimes it seemed like they were having a lot more fun than I was having. The music, the laughter, the joy was wonderful. And later I learned that a Civil War soldier, Austin Hazard, lived in that house. He served in the 54th Massachusetts, but he was one of those three Woodstock lads who went early in the war as servants to officers, the only way he could serve. The Miro brothers, Andrew, Charles, Edward, and Sylvester, lived in that red brick house here along South Street where most of Woodstock's blacks lived. Those four boys, as far as I know, all fought in the Battle of Olusti in Florida which happened in January of 1864. It was a vicious battle, though a small one. About 10,000 men engaged. The men who fought said it was some of the fiercest fighting of the Civil War. The Union force that day was saved by the rearguard actions of the 54th Massachusetts and the 35th U.S. Colored Troops. It was dangerous business because blacks were always under threat when they were at war. And as those black regiments protected the Union retreat, the wounded, so the story goes, were killed by the Confederates. Eighteen sixty-five was a dying year in Woodstock. Disease swept through the town. And of course, there were the Civil War dead coming home. River Street Cemetery has Civil War graves everywhere. There are the famous, like Thomas Seaver, who won a Medal of Honor at Spotsylvania Courthouse on May 10th, 1864, leading a charge that briefly broke the Confederate lines. And then there's the more modest stone of Charles Wentworth, the barber, 
He lived to be 79, dying in 1893. Behind him is a smaller stone for his son, Charles Jr., who also was a barber with his father, but he only lived six years after the Civil War. He died of TB, contracted when he was in the Army in the 54th Massachusetts. If you look closely, you'll find the graves of black soldiers in cemeteries throughout Vermont, including a very prominent cemetery in Burlington. I often walk in Burlington's Lakeview Cemetery looking for Civil War graves. There's a remarkable grouping of Gettysburg heroes here, including George Jerison Stannard, who led the 2nd Vermont Brigade in its attack on Pickett's Charge. Walking one day in the direction that he gazes, I found a group of black soldiers' graves along the cemetery's south wall. Black Vermonters who served in the Civil War served in eight different colored regiments as they were known at the time. Here in this plot at Lakeview, there are at least four black soldiers, members of the famous 54th Massachusetts and one member of the 43rd U.S. Colored Infantry, which fought at the famous Battle of the Crater at Petersburg. Israel Freeman fought at the Battle of the Crater and then came to live in Burlington. William Davis in the 54th Massachusetts lived in St. Albans and was said to have harbored fugitive slaves. He was a member of the standard post of the GAR after the war and marched in many Memorial Days, as did Leander Freeman of the 54th Massachusetts, who lies here. He was wounded late in the war in fighting in South Carolina. I didn't know of these soldiers until I found them here at Lakeview, but I certainly knew of Vermont's best known black soldier who lived in Hinesburg on the Lincoln Hill. Loudon Langley lived in this house on Lincoln Hill. He farmed here before the Civil War. As soon as he could, he and his brothers, Lewis and Newell, enlisted in the 54th Massachusetts. On the way, 50 Vermont black recruits stopped in Brattleboro, where they expected to get paid. Now, Loudon Langley wrote letters to the editor of Vermont Papers throughout his service in the war, and he spoke his mind, he was eloquent. He wrote about the Brattleboro experience. The boys at the time of their enlistment had been promised $18 per month. This would have entitled each man of us to the payment of $75 before we left Brattleboro. We would have been superhuman had we sustained all the disappointment that the truth conveyed without being greatly chagrined and disposed to mutiny. Indeed, I think that I may say that if the boys had their arms, that every man of them would have died on the spot before leaving camp without the payment of their just due. Well, they eventually did get paid, and they went off to war. Loudon Langley eventually transferred from the 54th to the 33rd U.S. Colored Infantry, and there he rose to the rank of Sergeant Major, the highest rank that a black man could hold in the Civil War. Indeed, I believe that had he been a white man, he probably would have been a colonel, maybe a general. We're standing just up the hill from the Langley House in the old cemetery that was the center of the black community. The graveyard has long been abandoned. There are no stones, just fragments. Here's one right here with some carving on it. Loudon Langley, during the war, in one of his letters to the editor wrote, <laughs> 
The boys are all pleased with the draft because they think it more than fair for all to share in the perils of the fight, as well as the blessings of the perfect, peaceful liberty that is sure to follow. But so many of the freedoms that had been won in the Civil War would soon be lost as Jim Crow descended on the South. Yet the noble fight made by black soldiers in the Civil War is not forgotten, particularly at the St. Gaudens historic site just across the river in New Hampshire. This is the home of Augustus St. Gaudens, one of America's great sculptors. He had grown up in New York City. As a boy, he had heard Abraham Lincoln speak at the Cooper Union Institute. He had seen Abraham Lincoln lying in state at New York City Hall. After the Civil War, he did a statue of Admiral Farragut that made him nationally famous. And when it came time to memorialize the 54th Massachusetts Regiment and its commander, Robert Gould Shaw, St. Gaudens was chosen. That regiment, which was raised around Boston by abolitionists, Frederick Douglass's sons were in it, became the first black Union regiment to go into heavy combat on the 18th of July, 1863, at Fort Wagner in South Carolina. And when they attacked in the late afternoon a massive Confederate fortress, they didn't have a chance, but they knew that the reputation of blacks as fighters rested with them, and they did magnificent duty and won glory at heavy casualties. St. Gaudens decided to depict black soldiers exactly as they looked. And this is the first monumental depiction with accurate black features in it. It showed Shaw, Colonel Shaw, leading his men through Boston, marching to the ships that would take them south to the war zone. Not long after the unveiling in Boston in 1897, the great sculptor Auguste Rodin saw a model of this monument, and on seeing it, he fell to one knee, bowing in reverence. Howard has also researched and written stories about what life was like for women during the Civil War. For our next segment, we rejoin Howard and Across the Fence associate producer Keith Silva as they take us to where history happened and share the stories of Vermont women during the Civil War. When the Civil War began in the spring of 1861, men rallied to the cause. They rushed to enlist at special town meetings that were called war meetings. On May 5th, 1861, in this building, the Linden Town Hall, 61 men signed up, mostly to join the 3rd Vermont Regiment. The Caledonian Record, a local newspaper, reported that on June 14th, 1861, quote, the ladies of this village met at the town hall in large numbers. It was an unusual sight, that of 35 ladies and 11 sewing machines in that large hall making shirts, gowns, pillowcases, etc. The job of running the state, working the farms, the factories, fell upon children and the elderly, but mainly on the women. The Civil War lasted four years, and the women of Vermont kept the state going. In this grand house lived Congressman Portis Baxter of Derby Line and his wife, Ellen Jeanette Harris Baxter. Ellen was a Strafford native. She had come home early in her married life to give birth to a son, Jedediah Hyde Baxter, who would become an army surgeon during the Civil War, and he would preside over a military hospital in Washington that treated 15,000 Union soldiers. An unknown number of Vermont women went to war, 
as Army nurses. Many worked in Vermont's three military hospitals at Burlington, Montpelier, and Brattleboro. Jeanette Baxter was a volunteer. When she was back home here, she went around town collecting things for the war effort. She gathered them at her house. She had women here to help make things for the soldiers. The women's war effort in Vermont well personified in this grand house. The Bedell family, Henry, his wife Emmeline, two children and a nephew, lived on this farm just up the hill from the village of Westfield. In 1862, Henry enlisted in the 11th Vermont Regiment, leaving Emmeline here to run the farm. He served until wounded in 1864 in a skirmish near Berryville, Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley. He had to have a leg amputated and was too weak to go with the army when it moved on. His comrades placed him in the home of a Virginia woman, Betty Van Meter, and she nursed him back to health. Finally, when he was able to travel, Betty put him in a wagon, covered him with blankets, and drove the 30 miles to the Union outpost at Hopper's Ferry. Betty became a Union hero and she and Henry went to Washington and met with Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. He gave them a pass allowing them to go to a Union prisoner of war camp and free Betty's husband James, a Confederate soldier. When the Van Meters returned to Virginia, word of what she had done had got around and the family was ostracized. Perhaps because of that, Betty Van Meter came north to Vermont many times in subsequent years, and certainly after the Bedells moved to Newport. She was a hero in Newport, and finally after many years, the Vermont legislature honored her by passing a special resolution in her name. Samantha Aldrich married John Stevens in 1840. He died in 1852, leaving her with five children. Three sons, Orlando, Russell, and Calvin, served in the Civil War. Orlando died at the Battle of Lee's Mills, and Russell died fighting at Fort Stevens, just outside Washington, D.C. Calvin served three years and came home an invalid. When I think about Vermont women and the Civil War, I often think of Samantha Stevens. She built this house during the Civil War, and night after night, she walked the two miles down that road to Island Pond Village to join with other women in making things for the soldiers. The local post of the GAR, the Erastus Buck Post, met on the top floor of what is now the Island Pond Municipal Building. Samantha Stevens was often an honored guest at their festivities, a rare honor for Vermont women. In this Island Pond Cemetery along Pleasant Street, which Samantha Stevens walked night after night, is the Stevens family memorial. Samantha and her husband John are buried side by side. Orlando and Calvin are next to them. Son Russell is buried far away in Washington, D.C. This uh, brick building on the west edge of Woodstock Village, now the Community Recreation Center, during the Civil War was the Woodstock Woolen Mill. With many of the able-bodied men off to war, a lot of women worked in this building, making blankets for the Union armies. As the war waned, the women got sick of their long, long hours, and they began talking to management about it they got nowhere. In 1867, they'd had it, and they walked off the job and went on strike. Why did they wait until 1867? Probably because the last Vermont soldiers didn't come home until that year. The 7th Vermont Regiment stationed way down on the Rio Grande River. The ladies didn't want to appear 
unpatriotic. While they worked here, the women lived in a barracks building across the street. Mill owner Solomon Woodward lived in one of the finest houses a bit down the street and off toward the base of the mountain. The day the ladies went on strike, they marched into the middle of Woodstock and into the finest restaurant. And they had the most expensive meal, perhaps here in a hotel where the Woodstock Inn now stands. And when they were all done, having thoroughly enjoyed it, they signed the bill in Mr. Woodward's name. This is Brattleboro's Canal Street. Abby Fuller grew up at 192 Canal Street. She was a teenager during the Civil War. And long after the war, as a very prominent Brattleboro lady, she gave a series of lectures on what it was like in this town during the war years. Some good women from our village were nurses. How much good they did and how many lives they saved, we can never tell or realize. After every battle, a call was made for old linen, cotton, bandages, and money for supplies. And I remember we collected $100 in an hour after the Battle of Gettysburg. Of all the Vermont women who lived during the Civil War, Probably the best known was Clarina Howard Nichols, who lived in this big old house that faces the village green in Townsend, Vermont, down in Wyndham County. She was born in 1810, about three miles from here, in West Townsend. Early on, she had a failed marriage that took her out to northern New York State. She had three kids. She finally left her husband came back home, and she married a man named George Nichols, who published a newspaper in Brattleboro, the Wyndham County Democrat. That paper was strongly anti-slavery. And when her husband became ill, Clarina took over the paper, writing many of her anti-slavery pieces right in this house. She also got deeply involved in the women's suffrage movement. In 1852, she became the first woman to address the Vermont legislature. By all means, sir, you are officially the first person ever to heckle a woman in the Vermont State House. Madam. Calling on legislators to approve a bill that would have allowed women to vote in school district elections. She was jeered and shouted at, but she finished her speech. As the Civil War approached, she moved to Kansas to be involved in the fight over stopping slavery from expanding westward. And in Kansas, she also edited a newspaper that was strongly anti-slavery, and her home became an underground railroad stop. She gave refuge, hiding escaped slaves in her home. Clarina Howard Nichols, native Vermonter. On August 12, 1912, the town of Coventry dedicated its Civil War monument, one of Vermont's finest, with likenesses of Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Admiral George Dewey, and George Jerison Stannard. The Newport Express noted that, quote, teams and autos and pedestrians were seen centering in from four or five different routes leading into town. The crowd was estimated at 2,000. The keynote speaker was Josiah Grout, former governor and former member of the 1st Vermont Cavalry. Grout began, they died for their country, that their country might live on, undivided and reunited for all time. And then he shifted topics, surely quite unexpectedly. I wish here to express the hope that sometime somewhere in the most prominent place for national observation in honor of and to the memory of 
the women of the Civil War who at home, in the hospital, and in the field did so much in so many ways to encourage him who bore the brunt of the battle and to soften the severity of his privations and to relieve the anguish and suffering of his hardships. More than 100 years later, no such monument has been erected, as far as I know, anywhere. Perhaps it's about time. Our thanks to Civil War historian Howard Coffin and Across the Fence's Keith Silva. Once again, thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.